Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 201, listeners' top 10 list. We'd like to thank all our Patreon backers for helping us bring you an ad-free episode, but especially Andrea. Thanks so much. You rock. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast for board gamers in the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. Well, Christmas is done. Episode 200's done. And I guess since we are looking forward to a new year and a new, I guess, era for BGA, I guess it kind of makes sense that 201 is our listeners top 20 list. Yeah, yeah, this is I I don't know if we've done this specifically before. We've asked people what their favorite games are. We've asked people what their best of the year are, but I don't think we went out and actually surveyed everybody and built a list. So this is the first time we've done that. We had. About 300 or so people tell us their top 20 games, and we were able to then compile a top 20 from all of the listeners. And actually, the list, there was enough information there, I was able to go up to about 50. So lots and lots of games, lots and lots of interesting stuff in there. So we're going to talk about it. I'm going to reveal it to the world. Bum, um, in, addition to the, <laughs> in addition to the one person who won the contest, who already knows the list, because that was his prize list. Uh, nice. And and yeah, it'll be fun. Excited to hear what everyone has to say. But before we get into all of that kind of fun stuff, we want to let you know that if you've already listened to our own top 50, the remainder of the top 50, number 51 to 100, is available right now for everyone out there at patreon.com backslash BGA. For just $1, you can get access here all the craziness of the back half of our list, which tends to be more surprising than the more traditional top 50. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where the stuff comes in and falls out and new games come in and things get replaced. It's a lot more fun to kind of see what's changed up there than maybe the top 50, where there's a lot of games that were still there like three, four years ago. Yeah, this is our last episode for the year. Obviously, we'll be recording another Patreon backed episode. And again, thank you so much for supporting us. It helps us get this podcast out there. It helps us get us out to conventions so that we're able to game with you. So this means a great deal to us. Thank you so much for listening during the holiday season. We know that there is not much time, especially with everything going on with New Year's Eve right around the corner, but we will still have brand new episodes for you. So just in case you are stuck in one of those awkward family situations that you just can't escape from, Pop on your earphones because we're going to have some brand new episodes for you. We want to take a look back at our top 50 games and see which games may have dropped off, which games may have popped back on or how they kind of moved around on the list. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we built this list about three years ago. You can actually go to the website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, and you can see all of our top 50s from 2016 when we had episode 100. And there's mine and Chris's and Daniel's and Drew's. They're all up there. You can see all of them. And, you know, some of the games that were there are still there. And some of them fell off completely. And there's obviously a lot of new games that have come out in the last three years that that made the list as well. But I think it's always fun to look at the stuff. And obviously, if a game is on the top 50, we really enjoyed it at one point. Why did it fall off? That's, That's always the big question, right? Why is it no longer there? Was it replaced? Do you not play it anymore? Do you suddenly realize you hate it? I don't, I don't know. I think for me, there's a few that fit all three of those. It'd be kind of fun to look through all that. All right, Anthony. So let's take a look at our top 50 list. As you mentioned, that's on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. And let's talk about games that actually dropped off of our top 50. Not only are they not on our top 50, but maybe they're not even on our top 100. So what are some of those games that you thought would never drop off the list and now they're gone or at least past the 100 mark? I mean, a lot of these games in the top 50 are like maybe in the back half of my top 100, which, again, it's on Patreon. You guys can check it out. So but the games that completely disappeared, I didn't even consider ranking for various reasons. There are a few of them. The first one, if you look at my top 50, is Tragedy Looper. That one was number 49 for me three years ago. Now it's nowhere near my top 100. And it's not because I don't think it's any good. It's that it's insanely hard to teach, insanely hard to get to the table. 
I don't have a team a group to play it with. And there's so many other games that kind of replace it in terms of that kind of table presence. It's never getting played again. So I, I couldn't in good conscience put it anywhere near that top 100 if I'm never going to play it again. Moving down the list, we have Lewis and Clark actually fell off my list. I don't get this one to the table very often. And I maybe it's just it needed a infusion of new content, some kind of upgrade, new expansion it has a lot of promos. I don't know what it is. It just doesn't get played. I still really like it. If it was going to be ranked, it's probably in the right after 100, but it didn't quite make the list just because of all those reasons. Mission Red Planet, another game that I really, really enjoyed when I first got my hands on it, the new edition, and I just don't get this played very often. And it's probably just up there in the 110s, 120s as a result. Ascension, probably still my favorite like quick bite deck builder, but I don't play this one very often and not a lot of people are interested in playing it. I think there's a lot of other deck builders out there like Clank and some of these newer games that are just more accessible, easier to teach. Everybody has them and knows them that end up hitting the table a little bit more often. So Ascension kind of fell off for that reason. Moving down the list here, a couple of games that I still adore that ended up falling off the list just because I cannot get them played. And it is, you know, I think that's the great downfall of many board games uh, is just how hard they are to get to the table. Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game. A lot of other Civ games that are a little bit easier for me to play. I still love this game, but it is a beast to play and you need a lot of expansions just to make it work properly. And then Rune Wars, which is still one of my favorite 4X games. I would, if somebody come up to me today and be like, hey, you want to play Rune Wars this weekend? I'd be like, yes, but that hasn't happened in about four years. So <laughs> this game does not get played nearly enough. Uh, Time Stories was really, really hot back in 2016. I played it a lot. It has... The last few cycles just really haven't been there, I don't feel. Like those first couple packs were really good. Since then, they're not quite as good. They're not quite as engaging. The group for this kind of fell apart. And part of that, too, is it got a little cannibalized by things like Gloomhaven and the Legacy games that do have those groups. This one does not, and so therefore it is not on the list. Pandemic is no longer on my list, a variety of reasons. I mean, there's Legacy version of the game, obviously, is up there. There's all these other new versions of the game, new takes on this type of mechanic. I still like Pandemic just fine, but for me at this point, it's less of a game and more of a framework for a game. So I never think I want to play Pandemic. I think I would like to play a Pandemic-like game. Uh, and that's what ends up happening there. Mice and Mystics, though, is probably one of the highest ranked games that I dropped off my list. And that's just because the game that was released next by this designer stuffed fables was so good that it kind of replaced it for me my kids don't really want to play my Mystics anymore they want to play stuffed fables it's more interesting and it has more interesting mechanics happening you don't die as often i can kind of guide them through it a little bit better my Mystics is still a great entry level dungeon crawl i just don't think there's a place for that right now for me and i'm hoping to come back to this someday and finish it but we are not there yet and then the the last one that Went off my list completely. It's kind of a an asterisk in that Terra Mystica because, of course, it was replaced by another game. Yeah, for me, there was a good number of games that dropped off. Obviously, there was a lot of games that moved about a bit. And as you mentioned, putting the list together was really difficult because sometimes a game, even though it's a great game, just does not get table time. And sometimes it's still a great game. But there was another game that kind of replaced it. Or as you mentioned, there are a lot of games that nip at the edges of a game where they just kind of pull the fan base away from that. I think for me, Defenders of the Realm, which was number one previously, kind of kind of get pulled back because a lot of people were playing Gloomhaven and that pulled away the population. But for me, the games that really completely fell off the top 100 and maybe are around the top 150 or so, Nevermore. Nevermore uh, was a game that used to get a lot of table time, gets no table time now. There are so many social deduction games, and they're very much kind of flash in the pan, so that dropped off. Shadowhunters is one of the very few social deduction games I like a lot, and it's very thematic, very interesting, and it just really hasn't hit the table because it, there really hasn't been a lot of copies around. It was out of print for a long time, so it's kind of fallen to the back. Eventually, one day, I will pick up a copy somewhere and bring it back to the table. Smash Up, surprisingly, dropped off my top 100. I'm still getting the expansions, but it's still not getting the table time. Again, there's been a lot of other games, especially by AEG, 
that has kind of taken up that area because there are so many card games out there. And now there's so many different expansions to smash up that people are not typically familiar with all the different factions. So a game tends to take a lot longer, even though there is the app out now, which kind of brings back the classic factions. Castles of Mad King Ludwig on my top 50 until all the other Castles <laughs> game came out from Bezier Games. And I think that was a detriment to the game because everyone was like, oh, but there's this new version of it. I'm like, no, that game is actually different. The palaces don't really have 100% to do with what the Castles did. But now those games are out. Now Between Two Castles are out. So Castles of Mad King Ludwig has kind of gotten left behind. I also had a Game of Thrones, the card game out there. Obviously, they had a second edition come out, which got rid of the whole first edition. And I think only got that game to the table at one time. And right now, I don't have the group that plays that. So that kind of fell off the list. Alhambra used to be in my top 50. And that's just another one of those gateway games that, although very good, is kind of been replaced by a lot of other more gateway hot kind of games. Glenmore was another game that was up there. Obviously, Glenmore 2 is coming out. So Glenmore being out of print probably was the, you know, the dagger in the heart here so much. But Glenmore 2 is something I definitely want to get to the table because I did enjoy Glenmore. Imperial, and I guess Imperial 2030 was a game that I used to get together with a group, but that group is no longer together. And Imperial is a game that tends to throw gamer groups into a loop because they look at it like, oh, this is Risk. This is Dudes on a Map. It's like... Nope, this is actually the oligarchy kind of controlling industry and warfare for their own purposes to move up their stocks. And just people kind of glaze over. And I'm like, all right, we'll play something lighter. So that game really hasn't hit the table. Speaking of which, a Game of Thrones, the board game second edition was another fun thematic game, but it only played best when you had a full player count because otherwise one player kind of benefited from not having a neighbor keeping them in check. The new expansion is, I believe, out so I think this game may eventually get some more table time, although I think it's going to require a little more complexity and a little more players than it did previously. So we'll see how that kind of works out. The Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is now an app. So I've played it a number of times as an app. But as a card game, I have not gotten this game to the table at all, unfortunately. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an interesting one. It's like the uh, Citizen Kane of gaming. It, a lot of their mechanics are now found in better games. And while Puerto Rico still is a very good game because it's somewhat problematic thematically and because you find a lot of the mechanics in other places, it just doesn't get the table time. Speaking of which, Mombasa, one of my favorite games because of the card play and the dynamic you know, markets that they kind of come into play. Once again, the... Theme is a little problematic, so I'm not really sure what to do with this so much, but it still mechanically kind of remains one of my favorite games. So it Palaces of Carrera, which is another fun, fun game, but that's another game that really didn't have a wide release in the US, and the group that I usually have that plays it is now really playing other games. So I love the game. It's part of my collection, but just unfortunately does not get table time. All right, Anthony, so those are the games that dropped off our list. And hopefully they will eventually, possibly, maybe one day get back on or maybe get on with a reprint or an expansion. But let's get on to the games that really matter. Let's talk about our listeners' top 20. All right, Anthony, so I have no idea what's on this list. You've been keeping it from me despite my best efforts to wrench it from your hands to find out all the little secrets here. I know you got more than the top 20, so... Give me some feel for what our listeners are getting to the table. Yeah, yeah, this is a, uh, it was fun. I got a lot, a lot of entries, so we got a lot of diversity in the types of games people liked. I think overall, there was something like 600 different games wow. listed, or 400 <laughs> different games. It was hundreds of different games across all of the different responses. Some people went above and beyond the 20 that I asked for. So lots and lots of games to draw from, and that meant that we had to do a lot of kind of counting to see which ones showed up on the most lists. The top 50, everything in this got at least, uh, I believe, 10 votes, somewhere in that range. So everything below that kind of cut it off there just because they started to get to like, you know, things that were uh, here few and far between. But up to 20, some interesting stuff. Twilight Imperium 4 does come on the list at number 50. I was surprised just because it's hard to get to the table and a lot of people haven't sure. played it. Gaia Project, a personal favorite, number 49. So a lot of people kind of picking up that one as well. We had some classics in here as well. Brass, Agricola, 
We had Marco Polo. A Feast for Odin is on the list. It is higher Ooh, than Agricola, whoa. just want to say. Uh, <laughs> uh thanks guys spirit island made the list at 37 that's another one that's kind of hard to get to the table everybody who plays it loves it but Mm -hmm. it is a tough one to get out so that's good to see star wars rebellion number 35 is up there time stories at number 34 still running strong a few games that we don't really have on either of our lists uh seventh continent at number 30 eclipse is on the list raiders of the north sea Mm -hmm. had a lot of love at number 29 and that's a game I still have mm-hmm. not gotten a chance to play. So after all these years, um, Orleans at 24 is a strong one, a favorite. Dead of Winter is a game that we've both played, but just never really hit with either of us. I don't think as strongly as some other people. That was at number 22. So lots of interesting stuff, right? Yeah, I think so, too. As you mentioned, it's kind of all over the place, but a lot of really thematic games. Even the Euros are very thematic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a... Uh, a lot of these games, especially in the second half of this list, are very experience based, like they're big, they're memorable time stories, Rebellion, Twilight Imperium, you know, they're like Imperial Assault, like these are the kinds of games people sit down, they take an afternoon, they play them. And those kind of tend to be the games end up on people's top lists. They are for me, at least, even sure. if I only play them once a year, they are, you know, experiences to be remembered, right? Yeah, absolutely. These are definitely their convention games. They are, as you mentioned, I think previously, like, you have to kind of like lend a whole Saturday to these types of games, but because they're so memorable, because the experience is so dynamic, because they take so many people to play, even sometimes the two player games like war of the ring or rebellion, I think you were mentioning. It's just something that you walk away from that and you just keep thinking about it from days and weeks to go. So I'm not surprised that those games are there. Obviously, if you could get those games to table a lot more, they probably would rise a lot higher just for just like us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and there, there are some classics in here too. Like Risk is at number thirty-two. You know, it's Love Risk. Uh, King of Tokyo is at number twenty-one. These are games that have been around oh. for a while and everybody plays. Legendary is at twenty-six. So nice. Um, like lots of it's not all new, big, epic, hotness type of stuff. There's some classics in here that just hit the table a lot. Yeah, I have a ton of King of Tokyo stuff. I have to actually bring that back out to the table because that's a lot of fun to play. Yeah, yeah. All right, so all right, so that's overall what we got a look at. So now let's get on to the nitty gritty. Where are we at the as far as the top twenty is concerned? All right, so let's dive into these. Number twenty is Betrayal at House on the Hill. What do you think? I'm not surprised. I know this is one of Daniel's favorite games. It's never been one for me, just because sometimes based upon the dice rolls, it the haunt happens too early or way too late, and then like you're way too geared up. But mechanically, the game is brilliant. I love the idea that the game could be so many different things. Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's one of those experience games, right? And then I think right now, two people are kind of getting hyped on this stuff. You got Betrayal Legacy, which mm-hmm. from all accounts is amazing. So it's Davio finally making another good Legacy game. Yeah, uh, Boulder's Gate's out there too now. So people are playing that in a different way. Yeah, they have the brand's growing. So it's not surprising to me to see this. Like, like you said, it's not really on either of our lists, mm-hmm. but... It's number 20 for the listeners. Nice. Uh, Number 19 is a personal favorite of mine. It's in my top 10. Um, It might have actually dropped down a little bit. It's number 17 now on my list. It is Imperial Settlers. I like this game. I I have the base set, and I remember playing this with you way back when, and it just didn't sing for me. I know that there's multiple expansions for this now, like a lot of expansions. And I think if I could pick up the expansions, this would get to my table But because I haven't picked up the expansions, it just remains kind of like a pretty static type of game. But I know this is one of your favorites. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the one thing I'd say about this game is it doesn't play well with four or five players because it just takes forever. Yeah. But you do have seven factions now to choose from. Lots of interesting things. Lots of different ways. You can do deck building if you want or you could not and just go crazy with it. A lot of different ways to play this. I primarily play it solo, but I do bring it out, you know, two, three times a year to play with groups of two or three people. And it's, it's just it still sits up there as one of my favorites. All right, number 18, and this is probably one of the top selling games of the last two years, period. Uh, so it's not surprising to see it here. It's Codenames. Yeah, I mean, as Codenames is kind of like been the new love letter where it just has multiple versions. You have Marvel, you have Disney, you have Harry Potter. They have a brand new gigantic one that's out there. Obviously, you have Codenames Pictures. I don't know if that's included with this, but this is probably the party game that you can play with practically anyone practically anywhere so not too surprised as far as it's concerned for me it's a lot 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 more fun 
being the person giving the clues than the person waiting to get the clues. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, that's a good point. I should mention the way I put this list together. I did combine stuff. It was it was like code names or code names pictures. I just put that under code names. There's a couple other games coming up where that will come into effect. Um, just to keep it from getting too scattered. Sure. Because some people mention an expansion or something, and I'm like, well, it all goes together. Yeah, but, I, um, I own code names and code names pictures as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good game. Um, it's a good filler. Number seventeen. This is. I think well ranked on both of our lists is Seven Wonders Duel. Yeah, that's not too surprising. It's a great little game. Obviously, it's one of my top games of all time. So I'm I'm really glad to see this game up here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um it's my favorite two player game. It's uh it's up there in my top twenty. So um glad to see everybody agrees. <laughs> um, number sixteen is uh one of my personal favorites and the game that breaks my No Cthulhu rule uh in my own house. And that's Arkham Horror, the card game. But I know that mechanically this game is fantastic. I know you talk about it all the time and that uh, you are slowly becoming one of them. So, yeah, I'm going to leave this one to you (laughs) and I'm going to walk back slowly. So go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it's just it's such a good game and it takes everything I like about Lord of the Rings mechanically and it makes it a little bit better. The story driven aspect of it, the fact that you can play true solo and not have to like double hand it. There's not as much deck building to it, which I love in Lord of the Rings, but it can keep me from playing it a lot of the time because i don't have time for that Mm -hmm. it does everything so well if it was a different theme i would probably play this every single night Uh, but mechanically it's one of my favorite games so glad to see it up here number 15 which i like and i know you've played a lot of is concordia oh man i love concordia actually i love concordia so much i kind of gotten burnt out on it a bit but this is just a really tremendous pick up and deliver game and obviously, as far as being a, you know, trading in the Mediterranean, it, it works perfectly. Matt Gertz, a rondelle in your hand. This made my top 100 list. And I surprisingly enough, don't ha- own a copy of this, which is kind of weird. So at some point, I will pick up a copy. And at some point, I'll pick up the expansion. And they're supposed to have a new expansion come out, which is supposed to be even better. So I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, yeah. I I don't play it nearly as much as I'd like to, but I own a lot of stuff for it because it has, I don't know, half a dozen maps now. So really, really solid game. Definitely. Uh, Number 14 is a game that I, I don't know. We talked about this before. We're not really sure how it got in the top 10 on BGG, but it's a good game. Not a great game uh, for us, at least. Great Western Trail. Yeah, the expansion did not work for me whatsoever. I really just added way too much to the game. I'm really still surprised why this is so high up on BGG, but um, it's definitely a game because of Fister, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, it's in my top 100. I like it. I think it's very well done. I just, I'm with you, and there are a few parts that just don't quite work. The expansion doesn't quite fix it. It's, it's more of a, like, I wish this worked as well as it seems like it could, mm-hmm. and some games are amazing and some are less so. So, but I understand why a lot of people love it. I, I do have fun with it when I play it. Uh, number 13 on the list is, uh, and again, we did this uh, poll back in October. So the newest version of this was not yet out. And that is Azul. So this is just Azul, no stained glass. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Azul's been at every game night that I've been at. And I do enjoy the game. Obviously, the new version is something that just blew me away. So I'm really excited that the brand, at least the Azul brand, is going to continue. So whether you go with the generic or you go with the new fancy version, I think it's it's definitely a good game to be on the list. Yeah, it's one of my favorite abstracts, one of my favorite fillers. Mm-hmm. So solid game. Number twelve on the list, and it's it's a game that just keeps on coming back. Like a lot of these games, they're they're hot for a while, especially the heavier games, and they fade away a little bit. But Five Tribes is still among the top rated Euros and. Uh, I love it. It's a little brain burning, but it's uh, it's a great take on the Moncala. I love. It. Yeah, this had a m- bunch of different expansions. I think some were better than others. I really enjoy this game. I own a copy of it myself. Just has not seen table time. So, you know, at, at some point, maybe this game will get kind of back around again. But I don't know. I think this game, even though it's mechanically brilliant and because it's Days of Wonder, it's a beautiful production. I don't know if we'll see this game around much longer just because... I think it might just be burnt out expansion wise. Yep. Um, All right. Number 11. This is the uh, the perennial discussion of whether or not this is a game or a game experience or what would you want to call it? But that's Pandemic Legacy. Uh, It's here at number 11. I think in my list, it was top 20. So 
also not top 10, but a lot of people put it up there. It is one of my favorite gaming experiences of all time. But in terms of a game game, just looking at it mechanically and would I ever play it again, which I wouldn't because I already played it. <laughs> it it's not quite all the way up there. I think a lot of people are in the same boat. Yeah, I'm surprised this is actually not a little bit higher as far as I hear from everybody. This is a fantastic game experience. Unfortunately, you can't play it again because now you know exactly how the game plays out. I think it's one of the kind of like marvels of board gaming. But unfortunately, because you can't play it again, it's not really a board game so much. So it's going to be really interesting to see how all these legacy games do long term. I mean, obviously, if they're good, they're going to get a good rating. But eventually, I wonder if these games are going to be on anyone's list because you're not going to be able to return to them again, even though you did like them so much. Yeah, it's a funny thing. I think anybody new to the hobby who gets into it is going to love it and put it up there higher on their list if they enjoy the game. But it's how these games rate is probably going to be measurable based on how many new people come into the hobby almost. Sure. Because eventually everyone will have played Pandemic Season 1 and don't need to play it anymore. It's true. All right. So that's the number 20 to 11. And now that we have the top 10 left, I figured I would ask you what you think is on the list and then we'll see what is actually on the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everybody that's listening is wondering just as I am, as far as what is the weight of games that really hit someone's table? I'm guessing we're probably going to see some, maybe a little bit lighter fare. So we'll probably see maybe a Lords of Waterdeep. I think that's a game that continues to hit the table. I don't think Champions of Midgard has kind of cracked things yet. I think we're probably going to see a social deduction game somewhere in there. I'm not really sure exactly which one it might be. I mean, there's been so many new ones that have kind of come in and out. What really kind of continues to hit the table? I don't know. Maybe we'll see um, maybe a resistance. I don't know. It's kind of hard because social games kind of pop in and out just so very quickly. You obviously mentioned previously the Star Wars Rebellion. So maybe I think War of the Ring might sneak in there. I know you and I are big fans of those. So maybe everyone listening is. Trajan tends to be one of Feld's kind of favorite games for most people it didn't make my top 100 i still do enjoy the game a lot i think it might make someone else's top 100 i i also think clank which is another light game might hit because people are still getting that to the table patchwork is a lot of fun as far as a two-player game i think that's something rising sun was big this year so i think rising sun and blood rage are probably in there because i'd be pretty surprised if they weren't in there Seven Wonders is getting some table time. We might see that in there. Brass Birmingham is obviously something that really hit the tables hard. Uh, I don't know if we'll see any splatters in there. You know, I'd be surprised if there was a food chain magnet in there. It's possible, but I, I don't just don't think so just because of the amount of time. I think we will see a Caverna because just it's Caverna as far as everything else is concerned. I think we'll definitely see a Scythe. It wasn't mentioned previously so i don't know not sure why it wouldn't be in there and i think that terraforming mars and gloomhaven because they've been the top games i think that they'll find their way up there and i guess the top one or two all right cool i can tell you you got a few hey um, let's see which ones <laughs> yeah this top 10 is interesting because yeah it has a little bit of some of the things you said and some other things that we you didn't really touch on and which we can touch on right now there you with go. Uh, number 10 uh, it's Carcassonne. Oh, wow. That's surprising. Way to go, Carcassonne. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I was surprised, but I don't know if I should be that surprised. When new people come to game night, they're frequently one of the few games that they say they have played is Carcassonne. And for a long time, it would be like Catan or a bunch of other stuff. But now it's, oh, we've played Carcassonne. We've done this or one of these 19 versions of Carcassonne. I think it's not quite as dated mechanically as some of those earlier Euros tend to be. And uh, it's still just as accessible as a gateway game. Okay. I'm I'm happy. I like Carcassonne. I don't have like the endless numbers of expansion to it, but I'm really glad it's still hitting the table. Yeah, absolutely. Number nine, you did guess. All right. I'm not surprised to see it up here. And that is Clank. I'm still surprised that Clank is doing so well. I mean, I like the game. The mechanics are really fun, but I guess the Clank in space kind of fixes some of the problems that Clank had. But from what I've seen happen at the table, 
people are still not that as fond of the space version. So the original version still gets to the table, even though you can kind of grab one treasure and run out really quickly. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's that's definitely a thing. Yeah, yeah. I've always been kind of in the same boat. I'll always play it if it's there, but it's not. And, but there are a lot of new expansions too, different maps, different mechanics that I haven't had a chance to play with. So it's definitely keeping it at the table. Yeah. Number eight is another classic, and that is Catan. Wow, Catan's there. <laughs> oh my God, that's great. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's It's really surprising to see these classics kind of stick around. I know, yeah. And it's part of that is just some of these games just stay at the top of some people's lists and for good reason. They are classics for a reason. Um, Catan, especially since Asmodee bought the property has been getting a lot of new versions, a lot of new updates. Uh, we've got like game of Thrones, Catan now all these different expansions, story modes, VR modes. The game is everywhere. Sure. So it is not surprising that it's still hitting a lot of tables. Uh, even if it's not hitting our tables personally, it's a, it's a classic for a reason. Yeah. I've been watching the game of Thrones version of Catan kind of like, jump up and down in price and like show up at target and and i wasn't too sure as far as how's it landing at the tables but obviously it's it's doing quite well yeah absolutely and yeah this is another one where there were multiple versions of Catan, and i kind of consolidated them down into this one um entry number seven is a entry level worker placement game you want to guess which one it is <sighs> it's got to be um lords of water deep I thought it would be too, but it is wow. not. It is actually Viticulture. Viticulture. Wow. Good. Nice job. Yeah. Yeah. Lords of Waterdeep actually did not make the top 50 at all. So I don't know if that game's hitting the table a lot anymore. I am sure. Yeah, I know. Me too. But Viticulture, <laughs> yeah, it's still way up there. Go, goes without saying how great Viticulture is. The only thing that kind of like pulls it back a little bit for me is that the card play is just sometimes so random that you just get lucky as far as that's concerned. But yeah, I'm really glad to see that this is up there. Way to go, uh, Jim. Yeah, yeah. it's one of my favorite uh, worker placement games, too. Number six, this is a Stefan Feld game. You want to guess which one? <laughs> you know, I, I guess the easy answer would be the Castles of Burgundy, but I'm going to stick with my uh, Trajan, my my outside my outside kind of track there. Ah, you should have ignored the gut and one with the brain. It is Castles of Burgundy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, Castles of Burgundy is... We, we just recently talked about this on one of our Patreon-backed episodes, how phenomenal this game is and how it's become part of board gaming culture. So I'm not too surprised because this game continues to hit the table, I, I, I guess, at the same frequency or even more, I guess, if we look at this list as uh, Catan or Carcassonne. Yeah, definitely. It's way up there. I, I was, uh, And that obviously doesn't have other versions. This is just people who said they like the Castles of Burgundy. Yeah. Number five was also on your list, and no surprise to me at all in this one, is Seven Wonders. Yeah, this has just been a perennial favorite New expansions coming out all the time, and the app is really a lot of fun. I'm generally not down for board game apps, but I blow through a, a game of Seven Wonders in like five, six minutes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I played, I don't know, my my log on this is crazy. It's like 50, 60 games in the last like three months, <laughs> probably on the app. Um, <laughs> yeah, and with the new expansion, especially if you guys haven't had a chance to try it out yet, Armada is really cool. All right, number four, uh, this is another classic that you actually didn't mention. I was surprised you didn't mention it, but maybe it didn't float to the top of the head. Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride, of course. I actually just picked up Ticket to Ride New York. It was on sale at Target. It was like 50% off. I'm like, I got to get this. It's Ticket to Ride. I mean, it's how could you not own Ticket to Ride? I, I guess for me, it's got to be Ticket to Ride, the Pennsylvania expansion, I believe, where it had the stocks and technologies that's really my ticket to ride but i mean ticket to ride is such a great game that's another game especially on the app where you can blow through a game in just about five minutes yeah and it's the kind of game it was like one for everybody like you mentioned the uh the the uk pennsylvania map which is fantastic i love the stocks the new york one is the one i play with my son and he loves it it's quick it's easy it's good mm -hmm. two-player version um, the France map is apparently very good. The new one that's out. Uh, there's so many different versions of this. So another, again, another one where I consolidated down a lot of these into just Ticket to Ride, but a lot of people still play in this one. So number three is the biggest game on the list, and that is Gloomhaven, like physically biggest. Ah. Largest. <laughs> <laughs> Largest in probably every dimension possible. Time, space. <laughs> It's just, it, it really is such a massive game. I've only gotten probably about 30 some odd games into it. It's kind of like the, the monolith from uh, 
2001. It just kind of floats over the table and you're like, yeah, I guess I have to play this. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to change humanity. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll play. Yeah, it's one of those games. Like, if you haven't played it, you should play it. I don't know if you'll like it because mm-hmm. not every game's for every person, but you should play it sure. because it is Gloomhaven. <laughs> um, there you go. Number two on the list. And this this actually is funny because uh, this goes back to our 2016 top games and uh, the conversation we had then. So uh, I'll just say number two is Terraforming Mars. Mm-hmm. And then guess what number one is? Wow. Uh... Best games of 2016. All right. Oh, the best game of 2016? Our best? Yeah, it's the same game. Wow. It's nice to know that people are listening to the episodes. <laughs> well, it's got to be Scythe, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So we had this conversation, I think twice, actually. I think we did it in 2016 for our best games of the year. We did our top 10 list. And then we did it again for uh, one of our brackets where we, these two kind of faced off against each other. And mm-hmm. I don't remember the bracket, but I know on the list, uh, Scythe came out on top against my better wishes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it was <laughs> purely on components, too. It was like, ah, he's stupid terraforming Mars. You're ugly. <laughs> So the listeners agree. Scythe was an overwhelming number one. I think it had sure 10 more than the next one. So it was on 40% of the lists. So uh, it was wow. way up there. A lot of people like Scythe. Yeah, I mean, Scythe is fantastic. I mean, especially the Rise of Fenris expansion. I was really excited about Scythe coming out. I enjoyed my play as a Scythe. I got the expansions, but it wasn't until Rise of Fenris that I was like, oh, no, no, no. I love this game now. This this really fits and fixes so many of the initial problems of Scythe, not to mention adding some really, really cool stuff, which I once again, I won't give away because they're kind of quasi spoilers. But nonetheless, if you haven't played Scythe, if it's not a game that's hitting your table or if you played it and kind of got bored or walked away, Find somebody who has the Rise of Fenris expansion. I think that's definitely going to get you back to the table to play this. Yeah, I mean, I have the next four or five days off because it is winter break here. And that is my plan is to get this to the table. I've not yet had a chance to play Fenris and I'm going to do it because people keep saying that. And Scythe has not hit my table very much of late for all the reasons you just said. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The number two game, don't want to skip over it completely, is Terraforming Mars. I for me, this is a, a game I play a lot more than Scythe. I'm hoping that again, I'm hoping Fenris changes that. But Terraforming Mars has, mm-hmm. regardless of how it looks and how overpriced some of those expansions are, it is still just such a solid, impressive, amazing game to me. That said, you know, we've played some games recently that do similar mechanics a little bit better. So we'll see where we're at in about a year. But right now, it's still way up there for me as well. All right. So there you are, our listeners, and of course, yours, top 20 of all time. We're so glad that you've joined us here for our last episode of the year. Once again, thank you so much for sharing our episodes with your friends, family, people at the table, for backing us on Patreon, for talking with us on Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. Wherever you can reach out to us, we love to hear from you. It means so very much to us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody else. It means a lot. All right, Anthony. So that's everything for this year. Until next year, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat in 2019.